Balloon rides will go to Camp Quality for children with cancer and leukaemia. That's seven nightly news for this Saturday, the 6th of March. Don't forget, daylight saving ends tonight and turn your clocks back one hour. I'm Ross Simons. Enjoy that extra hour of sleep tonight. I'll see you tomorrow night. Till then, good night. Sydney's Channel 7. This program proudly brought to you by United Airlines. Evening and welcome to the world around us. Beneath the streets of Sydney Town, there exists a world of which very few people are aware. A twilight world of tunnels, dripping water, and slippery steps. A network of hidden passages, forgotten dungeons, sunken treasures, and secret catacombs. Sounds a bit like the Phantom of the Opera, doesn't it? Well, it's all right there beneath Australia's premier city. Many of the tunnels have been buried for so long they've been almost completely forgotten, and some of the caverns have never been filmed before. No wonder, they are smelly, wet, cramped, extremely uncomfortable, and at times downright dangerous. Nevertheless, intrepid seven like the news reporters Lee Hatcher and Ian Watson donned their galoshes, took a deep breath, and set out to uncover an amazing underworld only a few meters beneath the hustle and bustle of the city. The result, an extraordinary documentary. So sit back and enjoy an armchair ride through the intriguing mysteries of Sydney Down Under. Sydney, Emerald City. In 200 years, it's grown from a few convicts and settlers to one of the best known spots in the world. Nearly four million of us rush around blissfully unaware that there's a side of Sydney we'd seldom see. It's only meters beneath our feet, but for all we know, it might as well be in another world. Sydney's like a Swiss cheese. There's a maze of tunnels, conduits, caves and ducts. Everything that makes the city tick is chugging away down here somewhere. You'll be amazed at what's down here. A fantastic wonderland just waiting to be explored. Dungeons, drains, dens, forgotten and forbidden tunnels, old army bunkers, even a secret passage under a stately home. Hi, I'm Ian Watson, and in this seven special news report, we'll be exploring the dark side of our city. Not the seedy, seamy side, but the damp, dark, hidden places, like this one in the middle of Sydney Harbour. We'll be taking you to places you've never been before, places you never really want to go to either. Just be grateful smell cam hasn't been invented. We'll be taking you to places that never, ever see the light of day. Come and collaborate with the cave player. Go diving for sunken treasure. And see inside the sewers with Sewer Cam. I'm Lee Hatcher, so join Ian Watson and me as we explore our very own Sydney Down Under.
Our exploration of subterranean Sydney starts in the city centre at Hyde Park. Here, buried deep beneath the peaceful trees, are a couple of Sydney's best kept secrets. In the early 1920s, Hyde Park was dug up and St James Station built. They only needed two tunnels for the underground railway, but seeing they were down there, they added another two, just in case. For more than 70 years, these spare tunnels have been waiting in vain for a train. The tunnels still get the occasional visitor. This one's been used as a recording studio. Its huge empty space gives it great acoustics and so the ABC built this to record some eerie special effects. But the most important use for this particular tunnel occurred during World War II. For this was, and still is, Sydney's official air raid shelter. There is another air raid shelter in Sydney, but not one you'd get to in a hurry. It's under the old dockyards and shipworks on Cockatoo Island. During World War II, many Navy ships were repaired here. It was an ideal target for the Japanese, so they converted this tunnel for the workers to shelter in. Carved into solid rock, it runs 500 metres through the middle of the island. Luckily, it was never used. Like much of Sydney down under, this tunnel is strictly off limits. Telling people to stay away from tunnels, though, doesn't put everyone off. For some, subterranean adventures become all the more tantalising. They leave their calling cards on the walls of unused tunnels and drains. Their record of visiting places they shouldn't. Unlike regular caving, this sort is highly illegal and dangerous. They constantly run the risk of being overcome by fumes or drowned by a flash flood. So why do they do it? Some people climb mountains and some people drive cars fast and we go in drains and tunnels. It's the unknown. It's the adventure of it all. Stalactites all over the place and change your shape all the time. And you're coming up miles from where you got in. And, you know, that's, that's pretty good. Coming up and not knowing exactly where you are. Just, you know, being there in a place that people rarely ever go. But unlike popular teenage Ninja Turtles, there's one place they never go. The risks are just too great. Uh, anything that involves sewerage, we just keep straight out of. Um, it would be res irresponsible and stupid to do so. back at St James Station. You may have been here before, but what you probably don't know is that just across the platform, tucked away from public view, is another unused tunnel. Until recently, this section of the tunnel was used for storing trains in off-peak periods. It runs about a kilometre along under Macquarie Street. In fact, where I am now is pretty well below Parliament House, about 30 metres or so above me. But the really interesting bit is up and over there. It's a bit difficult to separate fact from fiction on this one because it involves military secrets. From about this point on, the tunnel is reputed to have been one of General MacArthur's World War II hideouts.
the access we're using is certainly difficult, to say the least. So it's unlikely the military entourage would have come this way. There are quite a few shafts and dead ends, so somewhere around here, there must be other entry points. Whether General MacArthur himself ever spent time here in the finished section of the tunnel, we don't really know. And for reasons we'll soon see, it's unlikely we'll ever find out. Well, this is where MacArthur's hideout was supposed to have been. But it's all gone now. There was a fire shortly after the war. It raged through here for a week, destroying all documentation. The water in the now flooded tunnel is up to six metres deep in places. Long gone is any evidence of military occupation here or in other nearby tunnels. So we'll never know what really went on down here. There's a lot we don't know about Sydney Down Under, but dig deeper and you uncover some really interesting things, especially at Greycliff House, Vaucluse. The house was built in 1852. It's had a variety of occupants from wealthy graziers to private hospital patients, but unbeknown to most, it also had a secret. There's nothing like a good mystery. In the 1970s, Greycliff House was taken over by national parks, and one of their workmen was doing some repairs down here and fell through the floor. Come and have a look at what he found. Right under the floorboards was a tunnel, cut out of solid rock, just wide enough for one person. It seems to lead down to the sea. Maybe it was used for late night smuggling. Or maybe they really had something to hide. And why does it lead to this underground well? After the break, we make a rather chilling discovery and solve the mystery of Greycliff House. From Australia, it's miles to anywhere. That's a plus with United's Mileage Plus because it makes it even easier to earn free travel to just about anywhere you desire. In fact, you could be flying free after just one trip. Ask your travel agent about United's Mileage Plus. Come fly the airline that's uniting the world. Come fly the friendly skies. 7.30 tonight. The flight simulator for young doctors. A computer that teaches you how to save lives. The electric car becomes a reality. And the beach umbrella that lets you tan without the harmful rays. Beyond 2000. 7.30 tonight on 7. Her head is in the clouds. But her feet are firmly planted in the earth. She rejoices in the warmest sunshine. She bathes in the purest, cleanest rain. And amazingly enough, she works for Australia's own golden circle, Mother Nature, at her very, very best. McCarthy's greatest hits on CD and cassette and as the four CD tour box set, the new world collection, both out now. Hello, Ida here with another great improvement from Mad Barry's Home Improvement Centres, the all-Australian company. This month, Mad Barry's is offering up to two years interest-free terms. You can make monthly repayments for up to two years and pay no interest. There's up to two years interest-free terms on kitchens, bathrooms and many other great Mad Barry's products. 
check your new catalogue for detail and see what a great improvement Blackberries makes for you. What a great improvement. You must communicate. You must talk. Talk to your friends, your wives, your children, and above all, you must talk to your parents. Could you excuse me now for just a minute? Hello? Reverend, on Sundays, anyone can call Telecom STD anywhere in Australia from home for just one dollar for five minutes. Call your mum. Just talk amongst yourselves there. Mummy, it's me. Telecom STD, we're talking a dollar for five minutes. All the Bond action. BJ, we have company. No problem. This is the company car. All the Bond women. What is that? That's my little octopusy. Roger Moore is James Bond in Octopussy. 8.30 tonight on 7. We're under Greycliff House for clues, trying to piece together the puzzle of a secret tunnel. So far, we've traced one end to a well. The other end, about 20 metres from the well, goes through a small hole into an underground cellar. As you'd expect, it's very cool down here, and that's the clue to solving the mystery. It appears one Augustus Morris in the 1850s built the tunnel as a natural refrigeration system. The air came in through this right angle here, over the well and the water lying at the bottom of the tunnel, and it delivered cool air to the carcasses hanging in the cellar. A pity, really. I was just formulating a great murder conspiracy theory. When something's underground, it's easily forgotten. Out of sight is truly out of mind. Roselle Hospital. Built in the 1870s, it was one of Australia's first official lunatic asylums. Under Ward 8 is what could easily pass for a dungeon. Here's where the worst cases were held. Often straitjacketed, the poor unfortunates were kept locked up in pretty primitive conditions, to say the least. There's a bit of a mystery with this place. There seems to be far too many dead ends within these walls. Engineers have always said that the foundations here are much stronger than they really need to be. Over the years, there have been lots of stories of a tunnel that exists somewhere between here and the harbour, 300 metres that way. What gives even greater credibility to the tunnel story is that 19th century regulations banned the open transport of lunatics on the King's Highways, which meant that they had to get here somehow. If it exists, and just where, is a total mystery. Today's staff, like us, know only of the legend. Not all our adventures turned out to be dead ends. There were whispers of a tunnel travelling from Margaret Street in the city all the way beneath the rocks, coming out right under the Harbour Bridge. It turned out not only to be true, but we can still get into it. Up until 1961, this was the terminus for the busy North Shore tram line. Nowadays, it's used by secure parking to store cars. The tram service started in 1932 when the Harbour Bridge was opened. Trams ran from here, out through the now disused tunnel and onto the Harbour Bridge. This old photo shows what it used to look like. Now the tunnel portals are covered by two traffic lanes. These were added to the bridge when the tram lines were removed. 
the tunnel, minus its tram tracks, is just as they left it. There have been proposals to reuse it for transport or storage, but the cost of making it fireproof puts it out of the range of most commercial uses. Right now, I'm standing directly underneath the toll gates of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. 600 metres down that way is the old tram terminus. 200 metres down there is where the tunnel comes out under the bridge. It is a truly fascinating, astounding place to explore. But even if you were allowed down here, you still couldn't get through. A huge air conditioning plant is completely blocking the city end. It somehow seems sad that after being so useful for so long, it's now forgotten. When the new harbour tunnel opened, Sydney siders, as always, celebrated in style. But not so well publicised was the fact that this wasn't the first time we'd dug under the harbour. An earlier and much smaller tunnel was mined over six decades ago. The need for a tunnel arose in 1908, when existing electricity cables lying across the floor of the harbour from here were snagged a couple of times by ships dragging their anchors. This blacked out the entire North Shore transport system. So the call went out for new cables to be laid under the bottom of the harbour. The tunnel took the shortest distance across the harbour from Balmain to Greenwich. But instead of the planned two years to dig, it took 13. Our only record of its construction being this 1924 newspaper article. At the time, it was hushed up. A survey mistake meant the tunnel was too shallow and a couple of times they nearly dug through the harbour floor, almost drowning the miners. It's pretty much the same today as it was when abandoned over 30 years ago. The tunnel required constant pumping to keep the harbour at bay. In 1930, they finally gave up the struggle and let the water in. Power still ran through the flooded tunnel until 1959. Too deep and too dangerous for divers to explore, a remotely operated probe camera was sent underground and underwater to show us scenes that haven't been witnessed for over 50 years. These are the original railway tracks used during mining. A broken cable and this rockfall show that it's not all been plain sailing. But generally, the probe gave the tunnel the all clear should they wish to pump it dry and use it again. The two harbour tunnels aren't all that's under Sydney's seabed. There's rich pickings to be had if you know where to look, for scattered all about is sunken treasure. Some people call it treasure and some people call it trash, I suppose. And the idea of grown men running around looking for old pieces of aluminium and steel, etc., lying on the seabed might not be everyone's cup of tea. But obviously the romance of, of the sunken treasure, of the china, of the gold, of the old wrecks is obviously a draw and a draw card for everybody. Paul McGaw works for a Sydney-based marine company. They explore the seabed in and around Sydney using their remote operated vehicle, or ROV. It's exciting and challenging work. I mean, there's a little bit of the adventure in everybody, and we love to sort of fly along the bottom. You never know quite what you're going to find or where you're going to go or if you're going to make it through the day, really. You put the ROV into the water and conditions change. You don't know what's on the bottom there. You're descending down two, three, four hundred feet and trawling along the bottom looking for signs of wrecks or fishes or bits and pieces, anything on the bottom. So you never know quite what you're going to come across. And every day is different. You can go to the same place 20 times and every single day will be different.
Today they're off Bondi doing a job for the water board. They've waited months for the right wind and sea conditions to operate close into the cliffs. Even so, flying the ROV up the old Bondi outfall tunnel is going to be a tricky operation. We're checking to see that the tunnel is not getting silted or has, grease, or has got any grease down it. However, the surge is keeping us out of the tunnel a bit. We're only in very, very shallow water, which means that the buoyancy of the ROV is very difficult to maintain very different control, plus we're getting a surge factor as well. There, we just made it into the tunnel. So now it's trying to go like it's mad before the surge drags us out again. Wow. Yo, we're in trouble. Yeah. I don't know, I think we're back in the swell or something. More slack a bit, more slack. More slack. The ROV had, in fact, surfaced inside the old sewer tunnel. It's just a drop shaft going down like that. That's looking straight ahead. So we've flown in and looking straight ahead. And as soon as we rise up, we get the reciprocal from the salt water, which is too dangerous to get involved in. There's no growth. There's no, no anything. It's very clear. A quick inspection gives it the all clear, but on the way back, an unexpected find. Golf balls. So there's green ones and orange ones down there. Oh, there's thousands of them. This is just one, one sand hole. And there must be, what, 30 golf balls in there? 30, 40 golf balls? Oh, moving, they look quite good, actually. We have to come for a dive. Yeah. yeah. Excited by their find, the crew quickly put on their diving gear and are soon playing in the golf ball garden. Looking like little batches of eggs, the golf balls are swept to and fro by the current, and there's more where these came from. Not every ball driven off this tee ends up on the fairway. Years of hooked, slashed and duffed shots have dropped many a ball into the sea below. The old effluent discharge kept them hidden for years, but now, with the deep ocean outfalls, the water under the cliffs is clear enough to expose them. The golf balls, although entertaining, are a mere diversion. The real treasure lies further offshore. At the end of World War II, they dumped a lot of uh, surplus equipment off Sydney. There's a lot of aeroplanes, and there's uh, a couple of uh, cruisers from World War I and uh, they're the play jobs that we really want to do. They're good, fun jobs. And the aeroplanes are worth a lot of money. Just how much money? When they're restored, they're worth between one and two million dollars. Coming up on Sydney Down Under, blackwater boating and sewer cam. From Australia, it's miles to anywhere. That's a plus with United's Mileage Plus, because it makes it even easier to earn free travel to just about anywhere you desire. In fact, you could be flying free after just one trip. Ask your travel agent about United's Mileage Plus. Come fly the airline that's uniting the world. Come fly the friendly skies. Sunday. How do you talk to an animal? We asked Tenra Arena and Shelley. She gives me unconditional love. Meet a cranky duck who thinks he's a dog and a truly inspiring story. Farmer Gordon Phillips is blind. All on Talk to the Animal, 6.30 Sunday. Budget eyewear have glasses, that's frames and lenses for only $40 complete. I can't see how they can do it at that price. You can't see anything without your glasses. Quality and value, that's budget eyewear. Look. What is it, Michael? It's 20% more sultanas. Oh, if David sees that, he'll scoff the lot. Unless we tell him it's healthy. Uh-uh. <laughs> Kellogg's Sultana brand. All the goodness of fibre-rich flakes now made even tastier with 20% more sultanas. Is there any more? Yeah. 
20% more. <laughs> oh, Dad! Kellogg's Sultana brand. Health food made even tastier with 20% more Sultanas. Keeping your finger on today's computer technology is getting harder. The system you choose today must suit the technology of tomorrow. How are tomorrow's computers, printers and networking systems going to change the way we work? Or where we work? To keep your finger on today's computer technology and tomorrow's, visit PC93, the personal computer show. Tuesday the 9th to Friday the 12th of March, Darling Harbour, Sydney. It's time you tried Isocol, the tingling splash-on skin cleanse and freshener. One for the bathroom, one in the car, for after shaving, for hot and sticky or problem skins. Isocol is the solution to just about anything. It really is time you tried it. Hi. You know how I told you I was using Optus for my long-distance calls? Thanks. Well, this week I called Optus Customer Service because I had a question I thought they could help me with. The guy that I spoke to was really helpful. He gave me an answer then and there. I didn't have to hang on and I wasn't cut off. I got the kind of service that you should expect, but rarely get. And he told me Optus customer service works around the clock. That's Optus service. Sunday. Get out of here before I cut your ears off. Chica's old partner, Chong's in town. Caught him in bed with my wife. You sure it's his ears you want to cut off? Then there's trouble for the dog. Hank has a lung. Nurses. Does he ever? Right after the Golden Palace, Sunday on 7. Our next underground adventure takes place in Sydney's Outer West, about 10 kilometres from Prospect Reservoir. The water flowing beneath us is the 100-year-old Upper Canal. Constructed in the late 19th century, the Upper Canal still supplies nearly a third of Sydney's fresh water. It was a major engineering feat of its time, Entirely gravity-fed, it runs from the Upper Nepean catchment behind Wollongong, 62 kilometres, to Prospect Reservoir. Most of the time, the canal could be routed around obstacles, but when it hit Cecil Hill, there was no option but to tunnel straight through. With 20,000 kilometres of fresh water pipes, mains and canals to maintain, the water board rarely opens up the tunnel for inspection. But when it did, we took the chance to go along for the ride and film inside for the very first time. Tunnels were all done with horse drawn skips, and that's why they've got a flat bottom on them so they could lay the, lay the railway line through. A bit like a loaf of bread shape, you know. One hundred and sixty megalitres of water coming through daily at the present, because uh, Warragam is supplying most of the water. And also, they're keeping a level down at Prospect while all the work's going on there. So you've got some little stalactites hanging down here. You see those? The little fellas there? 100 years of stalactites, I suppose. Meanwhile, back in the city, it's time to explore Sydney's first water supply, the tank stream. I'm entering where the tanks that gave the stream its name were carved by convicts out of solid rock over 200 years ago. Uh, you want to come on down? Yeah, sure. Just face the steps as you come right. down. So turn around like this? Yep, that's the way. Uh -huh. oh, what? Well, lead on.
Ah, here's a change. Yeah, we get into the section of the sandstone blocks, the, as you can see, the, the, the round circular roof. They're beautiful colours, aren't they? Certainly yeah. are. You know, the colours in the sandstone could almost be uh, accused of planning it for future tours, I suppose, but of course it was. It was just the sandstone available at the time. So this was once Sydney's first water supply? It certainly was. This was the original water supply that they had. And over the years it was contaminated and in fact then was utilised as uh, probably our first sewage. <laughs> right. yeah. As you can see, it's been beautifully built. Superb, really. Curves. Yeah. Oh, here's a pipeway here. Yes, well that's part of the Benelong stormwater system that runs through to the Opera House. So this is a different shape altogether? Yes, this is a brick ovary form, as you can see. It's, it's basically the shape of an egg, oh, yeah. with the tighter uh, section in the bottom. Why is that? Well, that's basically there has an aid for cleansing, for self-cleansing purposes. Uh, the silk tends not to uh, settle so much in that as does the, the flatter mm. type pipes. So what's directly above here? We're under Hunter Street, Hunter Street in the city. Right, and if there was a big downpour in Sydney right now, what would happen? Uh, there'd be no emergency for our safety, but we would be wise to move our field quickly, <laughs> otherwise we'd be wet. <laughs> Tell us about the worst experience you've had in one of these tunnels. Oh, the worst experience probably would have to be, we were many years ago, there was a young guy I was working with, and uh, he panicked. He heard a, a loud noise behind us and thought the tunnel was filling up with the water. And he, he, he raced ahead and trampled over myself and pushing me under the water. He, in fact, climbed up a manhole, one of the shafts, uh, to get out of the thing. It was a very deep shaft. He clambered up the manhole, which is the access chambers to the, the, the pipes. And uh, at a later stage, we discovered that uh, uh, there was no step lines in the first 12 feet of it, so he must have just clawed his way up the, the wall itself. But yeah, well, that's probably about the worst experience. I can understand that. Mm. Coming up on Sydney Down Under, the rising cost of dying. They're escaped convicts, disguised as priests. I broke my phone. Oh, forget about it. And some of the flock need guidance. What are you, too scared or too cheap? Robert De Niro, Demi Moore, Sean Penn, the premiere of Where No Angels, Sunday, 8.30 on 7. Did you know that fishing's one of Australia's most popular outdoor activities? It's great to be able to get away and enjoy the peace and quiet of the great outdoors with family and friends. Right now, the new Nissan Fishing Show is on at the showground and you can get all the gear and advice you need to go fishing. There's rods, reels, line, hooks, sinkers, lures, everything for fishing. So do yourself a favour and visit the new Nissan Fishing Show this weekend. Uh, I'll see you there, folks. Many insurance companies advertise a low price on green slips. But do you qualify for their low price? With some companies, it depends on how many kilometres you drive each year. Others consider your past accidents or the age of your vehicle. But to get the new low rate on an NZI green slip, you just need to be over 29. Call 551555 or call into any Westpac branch for your green slip from NZI Insurance. If you've only got a few minutes to make a special meal, the quickest way is with Paramount Alaskan Salmon from the pure Arctic waters of Alaska. Bon appétit. Quick special meals are Paramount. I've known some pretty good all-rounders, and I've had a few tea breaks. So I can tell you, the new Tetley all-rounder has a lot going for it. Thank you. Naturally, the tea quality is excellent. But Tetley's unique round tea bag also has 2,000 perforations to let the real tea flavour flood out, which guarantees you a better cup of tea all-round. The new Tetley all-rounder. A better cup of tea all-round. <laughs> 
Want to buy quality carpet cheap? At Pay Less Carpets, do as the name says, pay less. Save $50 on Australian-made 100% wool loop pile, just $24.95. Save $30 on 100% nylon with stain block protection, only $49.95. Save $35 on genuine Feltex Berber, 100% wool, only $69.95. Save $25 on 100% nylon stain master, only $84.95. See the huge carpet selection at Pay Less Carpets, Auburn, Chatswood and Penrith. Why pay more? Pay less. Kick off the new league season in this week's Sunday Telegraph with this fantastic 20-page colour league magazine. See what your team's chances are in this complete look at all 16 clubs. Wow. Plus, every reader and a friend can fly Australia for $5 each when taking up the All Seasons Hotels accommodation offers. And don't miss a brand new set of free colour pet stickers. Get your league magazine, free pet stickers and fly Australia offer all in this week's Sunday Telegraph. Meninga, Lewis, Eddingshausen. Who will fill their boots when they're gone? Don't miss our seven monthly news sports report, The Young Guns of League, Monday at 6. Nobody knows news like seven. St Mary's Cathedral, a well-known Sydney landmark. Not so well-known is that underneath this fine old church lies a crypt. The terrazzo tile floor took an Italian craftsman 22 years to complete. A work of love, so intricate, it's almost impossible to see where the joins are. Under the floor itself, the final resting place for a few of the church hierarchy. A somber reminder of the fate we all face sooner or later. It's a dirty job, but someone has to do it. Turning the turf for those who'll spend the rest of their time down under Sydney in what must be one of the world's most spectacular graveyard views. This is Waverley Cemetery, where, as in life, so too in death, money decides just how much of Sydney's down under you're entitled to. Plots retail at about $3,000 a go. And then there's the upkeep. You can choose from the annual maintenance plan at $425, marked by a red cross, includes re-turfing and trimming, or the perpetual maintenance plan, marked by a blue cross, at an undisclosed sum. <laughs> Excavation by shovel and pick has a long history in Sydney. One of the earliest and most remarkable examples being the convict dug grain silos on Cockatoo Island. Since first settlement, the colony had been plagued by grain shortages. By the 1830s, it had reached crisis point. In good years, the surplus was soon destroyed by weevils and insects, and in bad years, the only option was to import and of course prices soon skyrocketed. So the governor of the day decided to build storage facilities. So he brought in the convicts and they built 22 grain silos out of solid rock. The silos are quite remarkable feats of engineering. Weevils can't survive without air, so they chiselled the rocks out in the shape of big bottles. The tops could be later sealed with cement, making them completely airtight and pestproof. Each silo held between three and 5,000 bushels. That's about four semi-trailer loads. 
And while it was being built, popular legend has it, the convicts weren't allowed out until they'd done their daily quota of chipping. The silos could have stored 10% of the colony's wheat crop. However, the British, scared of losing their world grain trade monopoly, ordered the governor to abandon them. Despite the stupidity of the order, he obeyed, and the silos were never used. The ties to Mother England left another underground legacy in Sydney, the harbour defence system. This is Middlehead Fort, now administered by the National Parks and Wildlife. This gun bit here was first built in 1912 for World War I, and then it was used in World War II, and after World War II it was then not used any longer because they decided that people were then bringing aircraft and they could just drop a bomb on Middlehead and blow the whole lot up, so that's why the forts became obsolete. Middlehead Fort has the most extensive underground tunnel network open to the public. There's always something fascinating and intriguing about exploring underground, especially when you're 12 years old. After the break, parts of Sydney down under you definitely wouldn't want to play in. The sewer system. It's untreated sewage, and I don't mind telling you, it stinks. But just down there in the next underground chamber, it gets the treatment. A fatal attraction. I don't believe anybody has the right to do that. Making her life hell, and the law is powerless. Give it up. Leave me alone. And the town that could decide the election. Real life, 6.30 weeknights on the 7th. Fresher Furniture's Leather Lounge Sale is on now. See the huge selection of modern and classical leather lounges reduced to unbelievable prices. These are genuine Italian imported lounges, beautifully designed and handcrafted, exclusive to Brescia at incredibly reduced prices. There's over 150 different styles of lounges and lounge suites on display, with over 500 available for immediate delivery. Hurry, at these prices, stock won't last. Only at Brescia Furniture, 119 Cabramatta Road, Cabramatta. Open seven days. Now I just want to mention that it's come to our attention There's a lot of junk on the streets You can help make Australia the cleanest country in the world Pick up a registration form now at any Westpac branch Yucky, yucky, yucky boo What are we trying to do? Yucky, yucky, yucky boo Sponsored by Westpac Getting a home loan will never be the same again. St George has changed all that with specialist home loan centres at convenient locations. Open seven days a week, nine till seven. It's everything you need to know about homes and home loans under one roof. We just cut years off our loan and thousands of dollars. So before you even think about a home loan, come into a St George home loan centre near you. They're open seven days a week. What a great idea. Road service, Jan speaking. Oh, hi. Um, my car's broken down and I'm not sure what's wrong. May I have your registration? Yeah, it's QD2. Get a patrol to you. Oh, that's great. And you'll be back in your way before you know it. Thank you. Call NRMA for HELP. This is 24 pages of energy policy. All major political parties have energy policies, but people generally don't get to read them. One paragraph in this party's 24-page policy clearly states that they will not oppose the development of the nuclear fuel cycle. In other words, nuclear reactors right here in Australia. Well, doesn't that blow you away? Authorised by Dr Helen Collicott for the Stanley Foster Foundation, Warrigal, Victoria. A mother's worry. You really are pushing yourself too hard. A student's anxiety. I am going to do better. How far will she go? I need to take them when I need them. Will she be found out? Come on, give us a look. Before it's too late. Home and away, Monday at 7 on 7. 
Come glance through the window to the future on Beyond 2000, next on 7. Then, Roger Moore is James Bond 007 in Octopussy. Depending on how you see it, we've left the best or the worst part of underground Sydney until last. Yes, we're talking about the sewer system. From our homes, offices and factories, it quietly flows on its journey through 21,000 kilometres of underground pipes, removing the poo, the pee and the putrid from our homes and workplaces. Interrupted only by the occasional maintenance worker, it continues its long, dark and secret journey until finally it hits the treatment plants. I'm in the Bondi sewer 50 metres underground. This is the main sewer line from the city and eastern suburbs. About two hours ago, all this stuff was a flush in the pan in the central business district. About an Olympic-sized swimming pool of the stuff flows past here every few minutes. It's untreated sewage and it stinks. But in the next system over there, it gets the treatment. Toilets aren't designed for the disposal of tampons and condoms, yet through the sewage system they come. Food, bones, money, all sorts of things, even the occasional set of false teeth and genuine diamonds. It may well get rid of our unwanted products, but if we don't want it to end up on our beaches, someone's got to pick it out, and the muck stops here. The small yellow objects in amongst all the grit are bits of undigested corn. According to the workers, corn and peas arrive pretty much as they left our dinner plates. Slightly chewed and a bit bleached, but otherwise intact. Makes you wonder why we bother, really. Since the advent of the deep ocean outfall, Bondi's underground chambers have doubled in size. They're the largest of Sydney's underground treatment plants. Altogether, there's enough room down here to park about 300 semi-trailers, an enormous factory hidden in a hill. But spare a thought for the workers. Sulphur fumes from the effluent create the rotten egg type odour. In fact, the air contains so much sulphur, copper pipes in the plant, instead of going green, turn an intriguing shade of purple. It also leaves yellow furry deposits on the walls of the effluent tunnels. But fortunately, very little of the smell is allowed to escape. What really stops this place getting up the noses of local residents? is this, a foul air scrubber. All the smelly air from the treatment plant goes through a chemical bath and comes out here smelling much better. But what's really interesting is where it goes when it comes out. Come and have a look. The problem with being underground is that Without landmarks, you lose all sense of direction and distance. So when you come out, it's always a surprise to find out just where you are. Emerging from the bowels of the earth into daylight once again really makes you appreciate some of Sydney's great above ground views. Next time you flush, think about who's on the other end, especially the so-called sewer rats. Once a year, they check on how the mains and drains are carrying the load. The smaller pipes are a bit easier to inspect with sewer cams. 
A tiny video camera mounted behind the lights gives a rat's eye view of the condition of the pipes. The sewer they're exploring today is about 90 years old. Steam is heat coming off. It's the heat of the lights that's on the front of the camera. I'm going to cook a cockroach from a couple of feet. In the relative luxury of the van, they can keep an eye on cracks, roots, and other blockages in the pipes. I'll just point out this part on the right hand side, they're tap roots that are coming through. They're about as thick as a finger. And just looking at that, there's around about eight coming in. This sewer's in good condition, but they can and do get a lot worse. Not only are all the joints in this pipe out of alignment, it's broken and dropped right down, giving sewer cam a bit of a job to get through, not to mention the impending disaster when, inevitably, it blocks up completely. Down in the wonderground of Sydney, there's always something going on. In a few weeks, the Opera House car park will be ready for use. A massive chamber has been chiselled and chopped out of solid rock beneath Benelong Point. At the time it was built, this was the biggest unsupported roof structure in the Southern Hemisphere. Like most of Sydney down under, this part of the Opera House car park is about to be closed up, filled in and locked away almost indefinitely. So this is our last chance to get a behind-the-scenes look before the ventilation switched on. And we certainly wouldn't want to be here when it does, because these two jumbo jet-sized fans will be sucking out... The camomile 